Thank you for tuning in to God's Demons and Magic in the Ancient World. I am your host, Sri Sachinandan Das. This podcast is an exploration of ancient mysteries and magic, the worship of gods and demons in antiquity, from Egypt and Greece to Persia and India. There is a special emphasis on the universal truth shared by these cultures and their similar mystical and magical practices. We hope to find illumination in otherwise cryptic and obscure texts. So today we'll be discussing the Egyptian mysteries by the ancient philosopher Iamblichus. Iamblichus was born in 245 AD into a wealthy family of priests in the ancient Syrian city of Chalcis. It's about 15 miles southwest of Aleppo. As a young man, Iamblichus became a student of the Neoplatonic sage Porphyry, and Porphyry himself was a student of the famous Plotinus, the very founder of Neoplatonism. He was actually his biographer, and he also edited his works. And Plotinus is a very interesting individual. He was a student of Ammonius Saccus. He actually learned from him in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, Ammonius Saccus is a very mysterious figure. He's believed to be possibly of Indian origin. Uh, and really, Alexandria was a place where many different cultures and civilizations mixed. You had uh, the Egyptians, you had Greeks, there was Persians, and there was also Indians. And so uh, various Indian philosophical traditions were very active in Alexandria at the time. Ammonius Saccus is, be- is believed by some, perhaps, to even be of Indian extraction. So Plotinus was studying in Alexandria under Ammonius Saccus, He became fascinated with Persian and Indian mystical traditions. In fact, it's mentioned at one point he attempted to join a military expedition to Persia in 234. But on the way, the expedition was aborted, and so he never actually got to go to Persia. Instead, a couple years later, he made his way to Rome, and he began teaching the philosophy that he'd learned from Ammonius Saccus. And over the years, he developed his own distinct philosophy, Neoplatonism. So from this eclectic tumult, this mixture of various cultures, civilizations, and religions in Alexandria, we see the the rise of this tremendously influential uh, religious and mystical culture throughout the Mediterranean and Near East known as Neoplatonism. Iamblichus, in many ways, broke free from the traditions of his predecessors. He believed, for example, that the soul descended entirely into this particular plane of existence, the soul being a pure spiritual spark of the divine, transcendental and immutable, beyond matter, uh, and yet somehow trapped within the fetters of material energy, these earth, air, fire, water, the various elements, this, this world that we see, hear, smell, taste, the soul being a divine spiritual spark, completely beyond matter, and yet imprisoned within it and struggling to try to attain purity and consciousness which allows the soul to leave forever the fetters of material energy. And his predecessors, Plotinus, for example, believed that when the soul enters into matter, it doesn't enter entirely into the grossest uh, field of existence. Rather, there's an aspect of the soul which exists in the, the realm of intelligible forms, sort of like a a realm of intellect, and so part of you as a soul is simultaneously existing and awake within this higher sphere of reality. And within that higher sphere of reality, the that portion of the soul is always perceiving things and thinking things, observing different truths, and then communicating that information to you subconsciously. And so Plotinus believed this, whereas Uh, Iamblichus disagreed, and he said, no, this doesn't happen. Rather, the soul is not split, nor does a certain portion of it remain in a higher sphere. Rather, you you in entirety are here at the present moment in this particular realm of existence, Uh, with the exception of certain individuals. He believed that certain individuals, they actually do leave a portion of themselves in this sort of subtle sphere of intellect by which they're able to perceive things in sort of a psychic way. Uh, the idea being that, you know, the a soul that in a sense is awake and able to, per, to, to perceive things on the subconscious level, sort of have their spiritual antenna out, they're able to absorb and 
and understand reality on a deeper level. And then that reality is communicated uh, on a subconscious way. And you see this especially in many of the different uh, arts of this time, such as in divination, uh, dream interpretation. For example, you know, an Egyptian priest at a temple, one of their functions may be to interpret dreams or to read astrological charts, to consult directly with the gods, to read omens. And in order to do this, one needs a certain degree of uh, ability to read the divine or to perceive the divine. And therefore, there's this element of yourself that exists in a higher state of consciousness. And for some people, they can actually tap into that and, and can receive messages through their own subconscious mind. And this is something that's described in many different paths of divination. Uh, for example, in tarot cards and things like that, being able to sort of consult your own subconscious mind, which has the capacity to see and understand reality beyond our own physical presence, beyond what we can he hear and smell and see, but rather on the supernatural level, you're, you're actually receiving information, and certain individuals are able to listen to that and understand that. The understanding, of course, from the Indian traditions is not that there's an element of oneself and a you know, on a higher sphere of intellect that remains in this sort of higher dimension and is able to perceive things from a higher perspective, but rather by the process of purification, the process of meditation, the process of focusing the mind and controlling the mind and controlling the senses and drawing the and sort of drawing the mind inward from the mind and senses and entering into trance and focusing the mind ultimately on the divine on the paramatma within the heart, one is able to naturally develop uh, mystic powers and the ability to perceive things beyond normal comprehension as a natural byproduct of the whole practice of meditation. And one can practically experience this as a fact if one actually takes up meditation very seriously and applies the mind, especially through mantra, on the meditation on the divine, then uh, very quickly, one can experience all sorts of miraculous and amazing things happen, uh, and one's perception of reality expands. And so, it's more or less from the Indian tradition, it's sort of a byproduct of meditation itself and spiritual practice itself. And it's quite interesting because what Iamblichus says is that the of all different types of magic and mysticism, the highest, and this is really one of the, the main points of this particular book, the Egyptian Mysteries, is that the, the highest forms of magic and mysticism is actually interacting with the gods, and which is done through the process of worship, the process of ceremonial worship, which later in many ways becomes ceremonial magic. And so this unification with the gods or interaction with the gods uh, is tremendously powerful. And... And within this text, Iamblichus mentions that among all of the individuals that have the power to practice magic and the power to uh, develop this sort of subtle capacity for perception, this supernatural ability, that the priests are actually the most qualified. He finds that the most qualified magicians and mystics are actually priests of the gods. And there's there's quite a few reasons for that. If we look again from the Vedic perspective, it's because the priests are meant to be practicing these these uh, practices of meditation. They're meant to be living a life of cleanliness and austerity and truthfulness, speaking only truth. It's quite interesting because you see in sort of the Western tradition, at least in modern sort of post-Christian uh, ideas of what magic is or ceremonial magic or worship outside of the Christian tradition, you see that magicians are oftentimes depicted as uh, very dark and fearsome and cruel, you know, like the the witch in her wicker hut in some dark swamp, you know, with the the full moon rising and dogs howling, wolves howling. So this sort of like dark negative connotation with magic is actually inconsistent with the whole practice as it was understood in the ancient Mediterranean. But in the ancient Mediterranean, it was actually those people who are saintly, those people who are pure and kind and generous in heart and gentle, uh, the priests. And the priesthood was supposed to develop certain qualities such as uh, forgiveness and humility and tolerance and kindness, generosity, living by charity, 
essentially non-attachment to material goods, to where the priest is more or less a mendicant. You know, he lives only for the benefit of others and lives a very simple, pious, and peaceful life. Now, of course, this didn't always happen. Many times priests were very powerful. There's a lot of political intrigue and things like this. You'll see in the history of Egypt, this is quite common. But as an ideal of, of a religious mendicant, no matter what the tradition may be, whether it be you know, and the, the, the followers of Pythagoras or uh, the ancient Greek philosophical schools, generally you have the idea where, where the true priest is somebody who, de, you know, they follow ritual purity and they have a very strict practice of worship and even ceremonial worship that day in and day out in a very regulated way they follow. But they also develop certain personal qualities such as, you know, as I said, purity, forgiveness, tolerance, kindness, gentleness, many of the qualities which are exalted or appreciated in Christianity. And so it's these these godly qualities which allow the priest to interact with the gods. You know, the gods, they're willing to accept the offerings of these particular priests. And the more humble, the more gentle, the more knowledgeable and learned the priest, then naturally the more the gods would be interested in reciprocating with them. They're sort of, you know, the, the, the gods don't want to be touched by dirty hands. And so if you have somebody who is very pure in their nature and very kind and is in a sense very saintly, they actually become the most powerful magicians. What to speak of if you, if you see within the Indian traditions and other traditions that the priest who is constantly absorbed in meditation and constantly absorbed in this mood of service, especially in worship, that they develop within themselves naturally uh, these mystic powers. They don't really even have to try. It's just a byproduct of their practice. And so Iamblichus is very clear that these priests are in fact uh, the greatest of magicians. And you'll see, you know, there's a long tradition of this. You see in the Bible with the Egyptian priests uh, and the the court of Pharaoh, you know, summoning snakes and things like this. So Egyptian priests were well-known throughout the Mediterranean, especially for Greeks and those living within Greek culture, they really look towards Egypt as the land of mystery, the land of knowledge, the land of magic, and especially towards the priesthood. And so in this particular text, which is the longer titles on the mysteries of the Egyptians, Chaldeans, and Assyrians, uh, we see that Iamblichus is trying to introduce us to this Egyptian priesthood. He's trying to uh, really give us a clear understanding of ancient Egyptian ceremonial magic and the worship of the gods. And many different things are discussed in this text, such as, you know, who are the gods? What are their positions? Uh, what about the demons or daemons? And what about the, the demigods, the half-gods, the heroes, the protector spirits? Basically, all these different subtle entities that pervade the world, that pervade the cosmos, who are they? What are they? And and how do you interact with them as a priest? How are you communicating them? What's it, what's it like? What is the very nature of the cosmos? He's really penetrating into what is this this high class of, of prophets and mystics and meditators? Uh, how do they actually understand the world? Iamblichus came in the Neoplatonic school, and his immediate teacher, Porphyry, how it had a very different idea of how to advance in applying the philosophy of Neoplatonism. For him, he was a practitioner of Pythagorean asceticism. He didn't believe in temple worship and ceremonial magic and interacting with gods and ghosts and demons and spirits and all these entities. Rather, his philosophy was to withdraw from these things and to live a very quiet and peaceful ascetic life of self-contemplation, much more like a a monk in uh, a monastery. And, you know, really using one's intellect to try to move forward uh, through rigorous study and practice. Whereas with Iamblichus, he had a much different attitude. Iamblichus took the philosophical tradition of Neoplatonism and he sort of submerged it in the mystical and magical traditions of Egyptian cult temple worship. Iamblichus himself was a belonged to the cult of Serapis, the Greco-Egyptian god. And so he was, you know, immersed in this whole realm of temple worship with the beauty of the incense, the smell of the various offerings, the flowers, um, the water, the 
beauty of the temple itself and the deities, the ritual music, all of these things, this, this rich and beautiful sensual experience was the world in which I amblicus practiced Neoplatonism. He sort of took this dry philosophical ascetic school and immersed it in this tradition of rich sensual worship. And so this text, the Egyptian Mysteries, is sort of an explanation of this practice and, you know, a description of its validity and its value to, to Neoplatonism, of which he himself was a master practitioner. In fact, Iamblichus uh, is considered by many, or was considered by many, to be a saint. It was actually, even there's many miracles associated with him. So he was a very powerful figure with the Neoplatonic school, and this book is very much an explanation of his absorption in the Egyptian priesthood and the validity of that practice, the power of that practice, and the worldview associated with that practice, and how valuable it is to Neoplatonism and his own personal development. Scholars are not sure if Iamblichus directly wrote this particular text, although they are certain that it's a product of his philosophical school. It's presented as a conversation between Porphyry and uh, the Egyptian priest Abaman. And so Abaman, and what happened is Porphyry had actually written a letter to Anibo, an Egyptian priest, and in that letter he asked many different questions, essentially what are the positions of the gods, the demigods, the half-gods, the heroes, the demons, uh, how does ceremonial magic work, how does ceremonial worship work, how do um, how does divination work, Why, how do various oracles, how do they work? And so all of these various questions then, Anibo presented to his own teacher, Abaman, and Abaman then begins to answer those particular questions in this text. As we enter into the text, I intend to point out and pull out certain statements and then utilize those to develop a, a picture of what the world was like then. We want to travel back in time and actually see the world as they did. In and the next episode, we will discuss the supernatural world as understood by the these world, ancient magicians saw the world in a very and how magic way. is and was in many ways an opening of communication between these worlds and our own. Thank you very much for listening. If you have found value in this, please like and subscribe. If you are listening on iTunes, please visit com backslash iTunes and leave a positive review. Thank you again, and we hope that you will join us next time on God's Demons and Magic.